Pearson Institute for International Economics. I'm the Institute's president, Adam Posen. It's my privilege today to host the latest of our series on rebuilding the global economy, featuring today the Honorable Lawrence Summers, the 71st Secretary of the Treasury, with advice to the incoming 78th Secretary of the Treasury on what needs to be done for rebuilding the US economy and the global economy and how they go together. We will also have remarks from our distinguished colleague at Peterson, Maury Obstfeld, formerly chief economist of the IMF and member of the Council of Economic Advisors on his advice to the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs and a broader perspective from our colleague, Peter Blair Henry of NYU Stern School of Business and a distinguished author and scholar on international economic issues. Before introducing former Secretary Summers and my other colleagues, I would like to just say briefly why we are doing this project labeled Rebuilding the Global Economy. We believe that until relatively recently, growing, growing global prosperity and growing global integration on net went together. Not always hand in hand, not every advance was due to globalization and not every advance in globalization was good. But in the broad, the advance of globalization and global economic integration was beneficial to the people of the United States and the people of the world for both peace and prosperity, as Cordell Hull and FDR stated some 70 plus years ago. We now look back at what has happened in the last 20 years and particularly since the global financial crisis in 2008, and we see that globalization and economic performance have been corroding. The pandemic and all that that terrible human cost that that has evoked has been made worse by the amount of distrust and interruptions in international commerce and international cooperation that were already brewing and in place as a result of decisions made by many people, but perhaps most notably the US withdrawal from constructive international engagement over the last four years. Therefore, all the fellows on the team of the Peterson Institute and many of our board members have come together to try to outline practical, short, doable policies for what we can do to rebuild the global economy. We chose the word rebuild consciously. There are things that have to be replaced. There are things that have to be renovated. There are things that have to be reimagined, but this isn't about architectural fantasy or luxury living. This is about rebuilding a framework and an economy that we can all make a living and peacefully do so. Clearly the forces of the big existential threats, climate change, pandemics, the slowdown in global productivity growth and now mass unemployment, as well as tensions in the international sphere imperil all of us. And we believe that global cooperation is absolutely critical in practical economic terms to address those issues. That it's not the only thing, but without it proper functioning addressing of climate change and all the other issues is impossible. In that regard, we have launched this series. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us, as I mentioned, three distinguished scholars and colleagues. We will start off with advice to the US Treasury from Lawrence Summers, as I've mentioned, and as you all know, he is the Charles W. Eliot University professor at Harvard, a distinguished economist, the person who identified and properly named the secular stagnation the world now faces, and of course, having served as director of the National Economic Council in President Obama's first term, and a full distinguished career ending as Secretary of the Treasury under President Clinton. Larry will speak for roughly 15 minutes. His memo of advice to his successor, 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 the President-elect Biden will shortly nominate is available on the Peterson Institute website. We will then take a few questions from the distinguished attendees in the audience before turning to our colleagues. Larry, thank you very much for joining us today. Adam, thank you very much for including me uh, in this program. Keynes talked famously about how most of what uh, policymakers do is distill the frenzy of defunct academic scribblers. These days, they distill the thoughts of leading think tanks. And it has been my honor for a very long time now to be associated with yours, uh, the Peterson Institute. I believe that more than has been true traditionally, the next secretary's legacy is likely to lie more 
in the international arena than anywhere else. In part, that is a reflection of the very great difficulty that is likely to be ahead in passing legislation in the domestic area or implementing major regulatory changes given the divisions that exist in our country. But even more, it is a reflection of the profound challenges that this stage of globalization has brought us and their consequences, not just for the international system, but for domestic politics in most of the major uh, countries. I do not believe that there has been a moment of greater challenge, but in challenge lies opportunity for an incoming Treasury Secretary any time since uh, the Second uh, World uh, War. As Tony Blair said recently with respect to the progressive uh, movement, the great difficulty is that the radical are not sensible and that the sensible are not radical. And this is a time when the sensible need to be bold in uh, their initiatives. I would suggest three broad priorities for the next secretary in the international arena, and then offer several uh, concluding thoughts. First, the first priority for uh, the new secretary must be uh, restoring both the habit of international cooperation and the capacity for major commitments at times of crisis. There are many differences between the current moment and the aftermath of the 2008 financial crisis. The one that stands out for me is that in 2008, there were bold domestic policies in the major countries, and there were also sweeping international commitments entered into at the London summit less than three months into President Obama's administration. Major increases in the capacity of the international financial institutions to provide uh, liquidity, commitments to maintain open trade, commitments of national policy to domestic demand uh, stimulus, measures to eliminate fossil fuel subsidies are just some of the examples. As we have all seen, the response in the current moment domestically, whether measured in terms of budget deficits or growth in central bank uh, balance sheets or a range of central bank activities has actually been substantially bolder and larger than was the case during the financial crisis. However, nothing of remotely comparable moment has taken place in uh, the international arena to date. I said some time ago that the DSSI initiative, the initiative around debt relief, constituted a squirt gun against a conflagration in the way in which uh, it has been implemented. Reversing that must be the first priority of the new Secretary of the Treasury. I would suggest that the United States offer to convene a leaders level G20 summit sometime in the first few months of the administration to be prepared with a G20 finance and central bank governors meeting. Out of that meeting, I would hope to see very substantial increases in the capacity of the international financial institutions to provide uh, funding to both poor and middle income countries, including a financial re-engineering of the development banks, expansion of uh, IMF liquidity, including through the mobilization of gold and uh, the issuance 
of special drawing rights. Second, I would hope that the middle income, that the industrial countries as a group would make continuing substantial commitments to stimulate uh, their economies so as to facilitate balanced uh, global growth. Third, I would hope that at that meeting would come important uh, commitments to resist new lurches towards protectionism. And fourth, I would hope and expect that at that meeting would come renewed international agreement on global public goods issues, of which by far the two most important are adequate funding of the response to uh, COVID and the mechanisms that will assure no COVID in the future, and measures to support a global and not simply national approaches to uh, the issue of uh, climate change. If that can be achieved, if a large part of that can be achieved, I believe the tone and mode and habit of international cooperation will have been reestablished. The second priority that uh, I emphasize is for the secretary to uh, lead a sharp revision in the prevailing understandings that underpin international macroeconomic policy discussion. The issues that have taken center stage for the last long generation in the wake of the inflation of the 1970s, independence of central banks, inflation targeting, resistance of the political temptation to inflate, avoidance of, uh, avoidance of excessive deficits, that crowd out uh, private investment, structural reforms to increase supply are no longer the top tier issues at a time when real interest rates are negative in essentially all major countries and they are expected to remain uh, negative for most of the next generation on a worldwide basis. Whether you call it secular stagnation, whether you call it a low neutral uh, real rate, whatever you choose to call it, these low interest rates and the shortfalls in aggregate demand that lead to chronic sub-target inflation are a manifestation of the difficulty that private economies are having in the information age, in the inequality age of absorbing all the private saving that is generated. The consequence of the failure to absorb private saving, in addition to shortfalls in uh, demand, is that inevitably it flows into Lever the levering up and purchasing of existing assets, leading to asset bubbles, high leverage, financial instability, and since the owners of assets are those who are already fortunate, rising inequality. This problem, these issues, cannot be usefully addressed with monetary policy, at a time when interest rates, short and long, are essentially on the floor everywhere. Even if they could be addressed, the consequence of even lower interest rates would be an even more fragile fi financial foundation for growth. The focus of policy therefore must be on the effective and constructive absorption of private savings. That goes critically to fiscal policy. Some of that involves thinking very carefully 
about acceptable levels of debt accumulation in the context where the issuance of long-term instruments is possible and interest rates are very low. It also goes to modes of providing for more fiscal expansion without changing the level of government deficits. For example, through reliance on the balanced budget multiplier or increasingly generous social insurance provision. If we continue to conceptualize the macroeconomic problem in terms of the traditional issues of crowding out, which is not happening, in terms of the traditional issues of the temptation to inflate when our problem is too little inflation, there is very little prospect of progress. And if we are not more successful in improving economic performance, if recovery from the, this recession is as protracted as recovery from the last, the political underpinnings of international cooperation are likely to be impaired. The third priority for the new uh, secretary and for the administration of which she or he uh, is a part must be more effectively connecting international cooperation as a project with domestic concerns. Part of that is about being successful in pursuing measures that raise standards of living. Part of that is choosing priorities. The competitiveness of US financial institutions operating abroad and hiring people abroad should not be an important priority for the next Secretary of the Treasury or administration. It is not one on which scarce political capital uh, should uh, be spent. Instead, the focus should be on international uh, cooperation, not to serve elites, but to prevent competition for elites from leading to adverse outcomes for the vast majority of citizens. No issue is more important in this regard than more effective international tax cooperation. It is simply an unacceptable American strategy to seek in corporate taxation to win a race to the bottom rather than lead a cooperative effort to level taxation up and to assure that transfer pricing, location in cyberspace, or use of tax havens does not permit profitable corporations to avoid paying uh, taxes uh, to the jurisdictions in which uh, they operate. Similar things can be said about regulatory uh, races uh, to uh, the bottom. At the same time, in discussing international support efforts and collaboration with international institutions, it will be crucial to develop a line of thought that emphasizes that they are not acts of charity or acts of international comity, but instead highly cost-effective forward defense of US security and prosperity uh, interests. It should never be forgotten that the GI Bill, the Treaty of Detroit, the availability of low cost mortgage finance to build out the suburbs were essential parts of the broad program that permitted the growth of the Bretton Woods institutions and the uh, Marshall uh, Plan. If a new secretary can do these three things, US interests and global interests will have been well served. Three final points very quickly. China and the relationship with China will shape everything that happens in the US's participation in the international economic arena. It is important that the secretary be a voice 
for the proposition too often forgotten in American debates that a wish list is not a strategy and that the establishment of priorities needs to include a consideration of issues on which we are prepared to make concessions and a careful evaluation of what leverage we do and do not have at our disposal. The dollar is, of course, a central responsibility of the Secretary of the Treasury. I do not believe there is a credible peer competitor for the dollar as the world's reserve currency currently on uh, the horizon, but it will be essential in uh, the time ahead for the United States to recognize that if it wishes to maintain the dollar's centrality as an international public vehicle, it must be more disciplined than it has been in the recent past about taking advantage of that centrality to pursue parochial foreign policy retaliatory objectives. Finally, as secretary, it is important to recognize that your credibility, your credibility in everything you say is an essential national asset. That very likely at some very difficult moment, it will be necessary that your credibility be employed to inject confidence and provide reassurance. In anticipation of that moment, it is necessary to preserve that credibility and resist the appeals that will come from many sources, internationally, domestically, internally to your administration, that that credibility be deployed in pursuit of short run and transient confidence building political objectives. Ultimately, the maintenance of that credibility is the maintenance of your most important uh, asset. Congratulations on your new position. Condolences also. You have heavy responsibilities and great opportunities. Thank you, Larry. Uh, and I know whoever will be the next Treasury Secretary nominated by President Biden, elect Biden, they will thank you for this advice for them to consider. Um, just to remind everyone to marshal our questions and take advantage of the excellent audience we have, please type your questions into the question and answer function on Zoom, and I will pick out as many as I can to pose to our speakers, starting with a few to Larry. Um, First off, Larry, building on your last comment about advice and the responsibility of the Treasury Secretary in the face of these pressures. Howard Schneider of Reuters asked some elaboration on the idea that the Secretary will have limited scope to deal with domestic issues. How sustainable is that in this political context? And, and how do you, when you came in now, I guess more than 20 years ago, how do you set your approach and your, how your profile as Treasury Secretary, given the pre-existing conditions you face? I came in at an entirely different kind of moment. I had been privileged to be Bob Rubin's uh, Deputy Secretary for four years uh, before the path the Treasury was on was felt to be a very healthy one. And it was my task to continue uh, that path while bringing new initiative as uh, issues like the Millennium Debt Relief uh, Program uh, presented uh, themselves. This is a very different kind of uh, moment. I hope it will be possible to legislate significantly uh, in the tax area. I hope it will be possible to launch major new initiatives around American renewal, uh, especially in the area of infrastructure broadly uh, defined, but it is far from clear in the current political environment that that will uh, be uh, the case. I also think COVID and climate 
and global uh, shortfalls of output represent enormous challenges with great uh, domestic uh, resonance. And so both using the international arena to address crucial problems and demonstrating that international cooperation is not an elite, an elite project for the benefit of moral abstractions, but is instead a way of protecting the basic interests of American citizens. All of that seems to me more important at present than at any other time that I can remember. So it is both the particularly challenging character of the moment uh, domestically in terms of getting things uh, done and the magnitude of the need in the international arena that lead me to the judgment that uh, international affairs are likely to represent a larger share of what the next treasury secretary does than has usually been the case. Thank you. Um, we've got obviously a number of questions. Let me try to group them. We have several questions on the issues of international debt. And you mentioned how Africa has been unable to go to markets and how even though uh, some of the developing countries have come out of COVID so far better than we hoped, uh, better than we feared, there's still much need. What part of your G20 agenda do you think about debt restructuring, DSSI? I mean, you mentioned the debt work you did when you were deputy and treasury secretary. Is there appetite for that now? And of course, also what role does China's debt have in this picture? China's, excuse me, not China's debt, China's lending to developing countries. I think there are three broad areas uh, for work. Um, the first is there are a variety of particular country situations that will need to be dealt with. Uh, I am aware of literally dozens of cases in which looking back, debt relief, debt restructuring, debt reduction should have been provided earlier than it was. I am not aware of a single instance in which debt relief was provided prematurely. And one looks back and thinks that there should have been more deliberation and more pause in providing debt relief. Second, the so far, the current highly voluntary approach to comparability between the private sector and uh, the public sector has not been working in the context of uh, the current crisis. The private sector has not carried through effectively on the commitments that those who profess to speak collectively on its behalf have made. I hope that through goodwill, quiet diplomacy, and uh, discussion, those issues can be addressed effectively in uh, the months ahead. If not, it will be necessary through the international financial institutions, through considerations of the ways in which uh, law will be enforced to consider firmer measures for assuring uh, comparability of treatment between public and private uh, creditors. I am also hopeful that as part of a broad gauged economic diplomacy uh, with China, progress can be made in the establishment of approaches to comparability broadly understood between the debts of all creditors. Sometimes that will involve recognizing that new money contributions represent a contribution just as accepting debt relief represents a contribution. Sometimes that will uh, involve recognizing the specific needs of uh, specific uh, institutions. I don't think demonization is likely to be an effective strategy for bringing about uh, increased cooperation. But there is an important 
diplomatic uh, challenge and the indications I see suggest that there is goodwill on both sides to finding approaches to working through uh, debt issues in a collaborative way. Thank you. A, a final question for this section of the program. You, a bunch of people have asked about currency, but we will save that for the end after Maureen and Peter have also spoken. Um, a key issue is raised by Kathleen Stevenson, Jumana Salin, and others is the interaction between fiscal and monetary policy in the situation we are now in, as well as more broadly in the secular stagnation framework that you've spoken about previously. In practical terms, how do you see, what advice do you give to the incoming Treasury Secretary on how to manage the relationship with the Fed and the Fed's potential cooperation, formal and informal, with Fed Treasury debt issuance? I think it's important to respect uh, the independence of the Fed. I think it's important to recognize that essentially interest paid on reserves that bear interest are the functional equivalent of floating rate uh, treasury debt and not much, if anything, should be made of the distinction between them for uh, macroeconomic uh, purposes. I do think that over time, it is appropriate that there be more collaboration between the Treasury and the Fed in the management of US debts. The spectacle, and I have to say, I did regard it as a spectacle that took place during uh, the Obama administration where simultaneously the Treasury was proudly announcing that it was terming out the debt that it was selling to the public in order to take advantage of low rates for the long term. And the Fed was announcing that it was buying up long rate debt in order to lower long term rates and twist the yield curve to uh, be flatter in order to provide economic stimulus. It seemed to me that the United States ought to have a single coherent policy on the management of the maturity of its debts. And it seems to me that institutional modalities uh, can be identified that would permit that conversation uh, to take place without threatening uh, the independence uh, of uh, the Federal Reserve. As a general matter, I would like uh, to see uh, more expansionary fiscal policy increasingly financed by the sale of long-term debt to the public. Thank you, Larry. Uh, this has been a unique privilege to have the 71st Secretary of the Treasury give his advice to the person who will be appointed by President-elect Biden as the next Secretary of the Treasury. This is part of the Peterson Institute's Rebuilding the Global Economy Project. Larry's memo to the Treasury Secretary is available on our website and has been distributed and is available along with the memos of several of our colleagues, including that of Jason Furman, advising who will be the director of the National Economic Council, Karen Dynan, advising the incoming chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Nick Lardy, advising who will be running the strategic dialogue between the US and China, and Chad Bown advising the next US trade representative. I encourage you all to look at these. And among those many memos is that from our next speaker, Professor Maurice Oxfeld of the University of California, Berkeley, also a non-resident senior fellow at the Peterson Institute. He has prepared a memo also to the Treasury, to the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs, drilling down on some of the more specific G20 and financial aspects. It doesn't have to be entirely consistent with Larry's advice. They each wrote independently, but of course there will be quite a bit of overlap. Uh, Mari Obstad, as I think you all know, is one of the most distinguished international economists working both in trade and finance, having written the advanced textbook on international finance and macroeconomics. He previously served as the chief economist of the International Monetary Fund from 2015 to 2018, and prior to that was on the Council of Economic Advisors.
and he had I had the privilege to work with him on our report for the G20 last spring. Um, Maury, please give us your advice to the Undersecretary of the Treasury. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> Thank you, Larry and Peter. Uh, the morning after the 2016 presidential election, um, I chaired a shell-shocked session of the weekly surveillance meeting at the IMF, and I uh, told them that uh, all of their assumptions about how multilateral uh, uh, institutions work were about to be challenged. And uh, uh, I couldn't have known then how accurate my prediction would turn out to be. Uh, these have been four very tough years for um, multilateral engagement. And in fact, things have gotten tougher as the four years have progressed. Uh, we now have an opportunity to uh, rebuild, to reconstitute uh, global engagement for the US and the very positive reactions around the globe to uh, Vice President Biden's election indicate uh, the openness of our partners to uh, that project. Um, the US is of course best served by constructive engagement, both with our foreign allies and competitors. And there's a broad range of issues that have financial repercussions, even though they may seem to be outside of the strict purview of the US Treasury. Um, so I will discuss some of those in my memo, uh, but I wanna, I wanna underscore what Larry said that, that messaging to the public is very important. And part of the project has to be to build uh, public support, widespread public support for global engagement by the US uh, to convince people in the street that it is central to their own well-being and prosperity. Now, to that end, I want to suggest uh, six priorities for the incoming administration. Uh, and these will indeed, uh, I think, uh, overlap to some extent and complement the ones that Larry Summers has uh, just laid out so clearly. Uh, priority one is to reestablish international trust in the US as a global leader and a role model. Uh, we do that by reaffirming some of our traditional positions within the G20, such as our opposition to predatory trade and currency practices. But we also do that by embracing the positive steps that are essential to protect the global commons. Uh, these include um, re-engaging with the Paris Climate uh, Agreement, uh, rejoining and supporting the WHO, and constructive engagement with the World Trade Organization. You know, specifically, uh, the US should sign up for the COVAX partnership to develop and distribute vaccines worldwide. Uh, the world economy will not do well if we have a two-speed recovery thanks to the greater availability of a vaccine in richer countries than in poor countries. And so getting the whole world healthy should be a, uh, a priority. And we have to convince people within the US that this is broadly in their interest as well. Uh, we have a separate Peterson brief on trade policy. And so I don't wanna to get too deeply into the weeds on that, but I think an important signal for us is to rescind the section 232 uh, tariffs uh, levied on steel and aluminum on rather specious national security grounds to show a shift of the US administration toward a more cooperative trade stance. Um, Along with Larry, I think it's very important to avoid weaponizing the US dollar's uh, global role as a sanctions instrument, except in those rare cases when there's a very broad consensus that that is the right thing to do. And uh, one uh, agenda that's dear to my heart is to stop the emphasizing human rights in US economic uh, international relations. The second big priority is on China. And I'll be brief on that since we do also have um, uh, 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 work on China uh, within this rebuilding the global economy project. But it's clear that, that the approach should be a multilateral one rather than the very transactional 
uh, uh, tactical bilateral one that the US has been uh, pursuing. Um, clearly there are many uh, problematic aspects of China's international trade practices and the way it manages its economy. And so we do have to keep pushing on industrial subsidies, on intellectual property rights, and try to update the WTO framework so that these can be uh, addressed in a multilateral way. Uh, looking at what China is doing now in relationship to Australia, uh, using trade policy as a, uh, a uh, bilateral weapon is something that we and our allies should push back on. Uh, up until now, during the last four years, the U.S. has instead been an exemplar of this very approach. A third priority is to ensure fair tax collection from globally active businesses. And again, this is a, uh, a priority that I think could resonate broadly uh, with uh, 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 working class households in the U.S. Uh, we are moving toward an unprecedented federal debt level. Um, in the environment of secular stagnation that Larry uh, identified, more fiscal stimulus is certainly going to be needed over coming years. And this is also going to be a problem in, uh, in uh, some of our allies in Europe as well. And this puts uh, tax revenues at a premium. We don't want to move to austerity, but there are ways to enhance tax revenues <clears throat> with, with fairly minimal um, effects on aggregate demand. Um, the Secretary of the General of the OECD, I think put it very eloquently <clears throat> when he recently said, quote, public tolerance of tax avoidance by companies is expected to reach an historic low in the aftermath of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, at the very least, the US can energetically support the two pillars of the OECD initiative on base erosion and profit shifting, aiming to establish minimal international corporate tax levels and uh, to uh, uh, shore up tax bases for internationally active firms. And this is an area where we indeed can do more. A fourth priority is to address corruption. Uh, corruption is of course an even bigger uh, factor in poorer countries than in rich countries. It hampers growth, drains the public coffers, and undermines faith in government and democracy. And we've seen this play out in countries from Brazil to Mexico uh, and in political reactions that range from radical right to radical left, none of which are ultimately good for global stability, particularly in uh, the US's neighborhood of the world. Um, what can the U.S. do? Well, uh, it can certainly reform uh, the way it approaches wealth secrecy and the foreign activity of companies. And to be more specific, uh, there are a number of actionable uh, items. Um, stronger implementation of the OECD anti-bribery convention and leading by example through stronger adherence to the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Um, it's, it's not often stated, but it should be, that when the US, when US business can more easily engage in corrupt practices abroad, this is in effect a subsidy to foreign activity uh, by our corporations bringing business offshore. And so this should be easy to sell uh, domestically. Um, the actions of the G7 financial Action Task Force, their recommendations on money laundering, terrorist financing uh, uh, have not fully been implemented by the US, something that is not uh, widely appreciated. We can certainly tighten due diligence requirements and um, identify the beneficial owners of real estate and land. Um, the recent release of data from the US Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Unit indicates that uh, suspicious activity related to corruption and to terrorist financing is not diligently followed up. And there are ways to deploy data analytics to uh, uh, be more effective 
in this regard. Uh, priority five, something that uh, is incredibly important, Larry brought it up, is to address volatile international credit conditions. What the G20 has done so far has not been adequate. Uh, the DSSI initiative has seen uh, take up by only about two thirds of the eligible countries and it is tiny. It does not address uh, private sector claims. Uh, at the G20 summit uh, that is coming up uh, for leaders, there will be a new DSSI uh, enhanced framework uh, unveiled, but um, uh, or at least a framework for that set of countries, but it again does not go far enough. Uh, the uh, G20 and the IMF need to push harder on the private sector to streamline restructuring or reprofiling procedures for poor and poorer countries' private sector debts. Uh, benefits will flow to the US from enhanced financial stability and from the avoidance of debt crises which crush output and demand in these countries. Um, uh, certainly a big priority for the incoming administration should be the ongoing 16th general review of quotas. The 15th general review concluded at the beginning of 2020 with no uh, change in quotas and with no uh, change in, in voting rights. And both of those is issues have to be addressed in the, uh, in the current round. And a final priority that I think is very important is to coordinate globally on cyber risks. Uh, just as we failed to coordinate globally and effectively in preparation for this pandemic, cyber risks for me loom as a, another Damoclean sword over the global system. We must demand that international financial regulators put these risks at the top of agenda and coordinate closely on practices and threat assessments. The Financial Stability Board recently issued a report, Effective Practices for Cyber Incidents Response and Recovery. This is a starting point for international collaboration, but we also can do more. And one thing we can do is make clear the US determination to join with our allies in retaliating strongly and promptly against state-sponsored cyber mischief, whether it comes from China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, or anyone else. I will stop there. Thank you so much, Maury. You've captured perfectly the spirit of what we're trying to do with this project, which have very well-informed, actionable recommendations about what to prioritize and how to move it forward. This is about the Peterson Institute and all of you trying to be at the edge of the tent. We're trying to do things that are practical and feasible, but make a meaningful difference. This relates to what Larry said earlier invoking Tony Blair, that you have to be within the realm of political and economic reality, but you have to be ambitious and bold when the challenges are big. And I appreciate your doing that. I'm about to turn to Peter Blair Henry, who I will give a proper introduction, and I'm grateful to him for joining us today. I just want to reiterate one point I should have said up front. All of the contributions to the Rebuilding the Global Economy project, including Larry Summers' speech today, Maurice Hobson's speech, their respective memos, are individual statements of their points of view. They are individually accountable. We are solely accountable as the Institute for promoting them and for their basic quality and fact check. The fact remains, though, I am delighted when independently our thinkers come to common approaches, just as both Larry and Maury have come out forcefully for putting international tax coordination at the top of the new Treasury Secretary's agenda. This is one of those issues where the U.S. interest and the global interest are aligned and the U.S. cannot fulfill its interest without international cooperation. Please let me now introduce our discussant for today, Peter Blair Henry. Peter, Peter recently completed service as Dean of the Leonard N. Stern School of Business at NYU. He's currently the William R. Berkeley Professor of Economics and Finance there. He has had an incredibly distinguished academic career. He serves in the corporate world on the boards of Citigroup and Nike. He's also in the academic sphere, the vice chair of the board of directors of the National Bureau of Economic Research. We knew him as someone very important and influential in discussions of international economic policy before he got totally caught up in deanship 
where he has provided leadership, including working on the PhD Excellence Initiative, a Sloan Foundation funded fellowship for minority scholars seeking admission to economic doctoral programs. We can't lose sight of those aspects of the world at the same time that we're talking high policy. So I commend and thank Peter for his service in that regard. But finally, I want to remind people of his book, Turnaround Third World Lessons for First World Growth from 2015, which in both content and title were unfortunately too prescient for what the US and the world are facing today. Peter, your thoughts on what the next Treasury Secretary, Undersecretary and Department of the Treasury should do. Thank you, Adam. And thank you uh, for including in this conversation. Thank you also to Larry and Maury for your very thoughtful and really, really important memos. Since I agree with uh, much of what Larry and Maury have said, I'm gonna use the preponderance of my time to highlight a single priority that neither of them mentioned explicitly, but is nonetheless deeply relevant to a number of the goals that they set forth. And that priority simply is this, the next, Treasury Secretary and Undersecretary of International Affairs of the Treasury need to find a way to transform the challenge of a shortage of infrastructure in emerging and domestic and developing economies into an opportunity to alleviate the global savings glut, raise global growth and asset returns, and reduce immigration pressures. So even before the shock of COVID, the global economy remained below its pre-global financial crisis rate of growth. Slowing productivity and declining labor force growth in advanced economies, as well as the absence of structural reforms in both the advanced and developing world have reduced expectations about the future growth rate of potential output, which reinforced the slowdown in demand, especially for fixed investment, in spite of, as Larry pointed out, record low real interest rates. And this ignited a fears of secular stagnation some observers, Larry among them, argue that major investments in US infrastructure could address these challenges by raising productivity and the expected future growth rate of potential output. Infrastructure in the investment in the US matters, but a quick look at the cross country data suggests that infrastructure investments most profound implications for long run growth are not in the United States or even in other advanced countries, but in the emerging and developing economies. And to Larry's point, this is not a matter of charity uh, or a matter of comedy. It's a matter of driving economic efficiency and productivity. So what are the numbers? Recent data from the International Monetary Fund illustrate that the infrastructure capital stock per capita of the developing world as a whole is approximately one fifth that of the developed world with Africa's per capita number at about 1 20th. In human terms, these data mean that 1 billion people in the developing world live more than two kilometers away from an all season road and 940 million lack access to electricity. Because the absence of, of electricity is most acute in those developing countries where the working age population is expanding most rapidly, their per capita power generation is about 1 40th, their, their capacity for power generation is about 1 40th that of advanced economies. Because of this, the scarcity of power infrastructure in certain emerging economies is a first order bottleneck to global growth. These large gaps in infrastructure per worker, moreover, are on course to widen in the decade ahead because the working age population in advanced economies is stagnant or falling. In contrast, the labor force continues to grow rapidly in developing nations like Nigeria, whose population ranks seventh globally and will expand between 2.6 and 3% per year from now until 2030. Additionally, a large number of heavily populated countries in Africa and Asia, such as Egypt, Bangladesh, India, Pakistan, and the Philippines will experience similar increases in their labor force growth during this time frame. All told, between now and 2030, a systemically important subset of the least developed countries on earth will add an average, an average of 1.7 million new workers per month to their labor force. To put that in context, that's more than one and a half times the 1.1 million per month that China added during its unprecedented episode of economic growth from 1978 to 2012. In principle, in principle, the combination of a boom in the developing world's working age population 
and a reallocation of savings from slower growing, growing rich countries to the financing of productive infrastructure investments in poor countries has the potential to alleviate the global savings glut and secular stagnation by boosting global growth and the return on savings in an aging rich world, delivering a positive sum outcome for the world economy, including a healthier climate if these infrastructure investments are, are climate, climate friendly. Without rapid and sustained infrastructure investment in certain parts of the developing world, the demographic shift underway will portend instead increased pressure on immigration in diverse advanced nations like the US to absorb an ever greater exodus of workers from a group of developing countries whose economies will simply lack the productive capacity to generate jobs for the local populations. Whether the world courts disaster or harnesses the unrealized efficiency gains associated with closing the infrastructure gap in developing countries depends critically, critically on US leadership. For the past decade, we have been silent on the issue of infrastructure that matters most. We and the rest of the world are paying the price for our failure to lead. In our absence, China spearheaded the launch of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank and continues to push its Belt and Road Initiative. The results so far raise reasons for concern. Again, even before the COVID crisis hit, the IMF had issued warnings about the rising risk of financial distress in African countries that had taken on non-concessional loans, largely from China, to finance infrastructure projects. And the issue of inefficiently allocated infrastructure finance to developing countries is not confined to Africa. Indeed, the recent case of Chinese officials taking control of Henbantota port due to the Sri Lankans' inability to service their debt under the Belt and Road Initiative underscores the potential for an era of wasted resources, protracted debt workouts, and possibly worse without US leadership. Now we know that flooding, emerging and developing economies with loans, aid, or free grids will not cure their shortage of electricity. But it also strains the imagination to, ima to maintain that the combination of a plethora of people plus a paucity of power and roads in the emerging world is somehow Pareto optimal. It is critical to find a new approach to the challenge of inadequate infrastructure in emerging economies and consistent frankly, with Mori's priority of adopting a multilateral approach to China, the emerging and developing countries must play a central role in the crafting of any solution. To be blunt, the World Bank has not been effective on this front. The Biden administration should use all of the tools at its disposal, including, as Mori said, quotas and voting rights, uh, to drive the bank's management and board in conjunction with the G20 to deliver an ambitious, practical, fact-driven, market-based strategy for catalyzing the efficient and responsible financing of productive infrastructure investments in emerging and developing countries that provides a viable and more efficient and more efficient alternative to the Chinese model that currently dominates the landscape. This is a big idea, but to paraphrase Larry, it is high time that sensible people be bold. Thank you. Peter, you are sensible, bold, and if I may, somewhat visionary. I am grateful to you for bringing that to us. And you pulled together so many strands. I would encourage you to uh, join an additional PIE event and we'll have you expand on your program and your proposal. I know that Maury has a comment directly in response to Peter, obviously drawing on his recent experience at the IMF and the exchange that Peter and Maury had. Then if our speakers will indulge us, we will extend the time of the event to 2.10 and I will pose to the speakers a couple of the pending groups of questions. But Maury, over to you, please. Yeah, I, I fully endorse uh, what Peter says, uh, but I just want to add one element, which is something that um, Nick Stern has been uh, uh, pushing for more than five years, uh, which is that, uh, and pardon my language here, <laughs> um, there are huge infrastructure opportunities in the emerging and developing world, but if this is not green infrastructure, then we are screwed. So to the extent that uh, the US has policy levers or that uh, the, the uh, community of richer countries has policy levers, we should provide incentives financial and otherwise for 
these infrastructure projects, which have big network externalities to be as green as possible. Thank you, Maury. Uh, I see Peter nodding. Um, so please allow me to post to Larry, Maury, and Peter the group of questions, starting with those from our board member, Jason Cummins, but many other distinguished folks on the chat about the dollar. Larry and Maury both expressed a more the conventional view on the role of the dollar and the need not to weaponize it, as, as Maury put it, um, than they were unorthodox in some other areas. There are people who were associated with the Biden campaign who were speaking much more aggressively about dollar. Um, could you offer some additional comments on how you think this is going to go, or more importantly, if you don't feel like speculating, although Peter may want to, um, on what's going to happen, how you think these arguments about for a more aggressive dollar policy, or maybe even a devaluation policy should be addressed. And if I could just jump in quickly, I think Larry said the most important thing on this topic, which is that the credibility of the Secretary of Treasury is, is probably the single most important asset the Secretary has. Corollary of that is the credibility of the dollar is one of the most important uh, assets in the US economic um, toolbox. And I, I see no reason to jeopardize that. You can you can think boldly in important ways that don't undermine credibility. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I don't know if Larry or Maury want to build on that or just agree. I think the right policy is to be for strong fundamentals and believe that if you're strong, if you are for strong fundamentals, a floating dollar will over time uh, take care of itself. I think that actively urging uh, devaluation. Um, as some of your colleagues periodically recommend, uh, Adam, is a serious uh, mistake. It's not clear how efficacious the policy uh, is. There's trillions of dollars that trade in the global capital markets at a time when we're likely to need to issue more debt, at a time when lower interest rates are very much necessary if we're going to maintain even a modest level of uh, investment, it seems to me to be trashing uh, our currency uh, is not the right thing for uh, the Treasury Department in a major way. As I used to say often when I was in office, uh, no nation can devalue its way to prosperity. That doesn't mean one needs to be for a religious kind of confusion of a strong dollar with a strong country and believe that at all moments the dollar should be pushed to appreciate. I think that we have a floating exchange rate for a reason and the right focus is on uh, fundamentals. Um, um, I, I, if we have a minute, I would just add uh, from a slightly different perspective that um, one thing that should stop in the new administration is the uh, current initiative by USTR and the Commerce Department to um, uh, try to identify bilateral uh, misalignments of exchange rates and use uh, tariffs to offset them. Uh, the case of Vietnam that's uh, going forward now is it would be a very bad precedent. And uh, uh, this is, is terrible, both on political grounds and on substantive uh, economic grounds. Great, thank you. Um, thank you all. There have been a number of questions. This is my second to last gathering, and then there'll be one more. Uh, there have been a number of questions about trade policy. Obviously, the Treasury Secretary and the Treasury Department have a role in this, but it is not their primary role. Um, but arguably, the Treasury is the most important actor in the relationship with China beyond the president, or at least co-equal with others. Um, we've spoken somewhat about what not to do, and Peter actually spoke importantly about some aspects of China's role in U.S. abdication that some people overlook. Uh, I think everyone has acknowledged the uh, mistakes made by the previous Obama Treasury in terms of the AIIB. Um, so what could I just ask each of you to offer one more specific point on what would be your next step with China beyond stopping doing some of the self-destructive things the Trump administration did? Let me, I'm going to offer two points. Uh, one, as I said in my memo, I would not favor initiating new agreements. 
given the fragility in the United States, it seems to me that an attempt to resurrect TPP would be of dubious credibility, would not in fact be strongly linked to US prosperity interests and would be an excessive expenditure of a new administration's uh, political capital. I would uh, seek a comprehensive uh, economic uh, dialogue with uh, China around the broad range of uh, global economic issues in which we have a common uh, stake, uh, some of which involve resistance of China to uh, US um, exports, but I would do that on a uh, multilateral uh, basis. I would do it also with the awareness that not everything uh, can be a uh, priority and that we need to make uh, strategic choices. In general, much more of our success or lack of success with China will have to do with whether we do or do not restore the power of the American example over time than it will with anything that is contained in specific uh, bilateral agreements reached on uh, commercial issues uh, with uh, China. I might just use this moment to comment on what Peter said, uh, which I relate to and when I speak at greater length about secular stagnation, I always mention as among the policy responses, the promotion of capital flows to the developing world. The crucial issue is how much of the lack of infrastructure investment in uh, developing countries that Peter rightly identifies is best thought of as a failure of international financial intermediation. To the extent that it is, it is crucial to fix it. The alternative is that it is a reflection of serious problems in the policy frameworks in uh, these uh, countries that makes both the private and social return to that infrastructure investment low. And I would want to focus on understanding which parts of the problem were due to a failure of financial intermediation. And I would record tentatively the view that in the current extremely low interest rate environment, where there are so many investors looking for yields, that more of the problem may have to do with the failure of property rights regimes, the failure of uh, being able to maintain uh, networks, the corruption issues that Maury referred to in many of the affected countries, rather than a problem that can simply be addressed by providing more financing. But Peter is absolutely right to identify this area as uh, crucial. Uh, my reading of the Chinese experience would be that they have had more difficulty collecting on their loans than they expected. And that that is a reflection of the fact that they have encountered more of the kinds of difficulties of the projects uh, earning lower returns than they expected. And I think that is something that should be cautionary uh, for us. But Peter is absolutely right about it being an issue that requires a very large amount of attention. Thank you, Larry. Um, since we have three genuine macroeconomists of scholarly standing, let me close by pulling together a last few questions, including a very good one by Thomas Jelf. Essentially, we're all starting from the point, I think that Larry makes, that this is, whether or not you wanna call it secular stagnation, a low inflation, low investment demand, low interest rate environment, which is likely to persist in which the pandemic makes worse. Going back to our broad themes, speaking as macroeconomists, how much can one country, the US or any of the other major high income economies emerge from secular stagnation on its own or must this be seen as a global simultaneity problem that they all have to go out together? Are we, are we stuck in secular stagnation? 
or is it possible that one could get out without the others? It's much more likely that we will get out together or stay in together than that one of us will get out while the others remain uh, stagnant. That's the lesson in the greater coherence of the international business cycle. That's the lesson in the rising correlation between uh, global uh, markets. That's the consequence of the higher marginal propensities to import over time in almost every major country. That's why there is the risk uh, that if one country seeks to pursue highly expansionary fiscal policies and others don't, an important part of the consequence will be that it will support demand outside uh, its borders and will uh, increase its trade deficit with the associated consequences uh, for worker dislocation and for protectionism. That's why I put such emphasis on the broad promulgation of this way of understanding uh, the global economy, which is becoming increasingly widely accepted among uh, economists whose acceptance has reached to a significant but far from total extent uh, the central banking community, but is still regarded as unorthodox in important parts of uh, the political uh, community. And so I think that what has been odd to me is how fast uh, thinking changed in response to the great problems of the 1930s, how fast thinking changed in response to the inflation of the 1970s, and how much there has been a clinging to orthodoxy in the views of so many um, in, uh, after the recent, now actually quite protracted uh, period of problematic performance. Thank you, Larry. I think we're gonna have to end it there. This has been an outstanding occasion. I am grateful to everyone who participated the memos by Professor Summers to the Secretary of the Treasury and Professor Obstfeld to the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs to be appointed by President-elect Biden are available on the Peterson Institute website and distributed widely. We will make them available to anyone who wants to read them or republish them. We will also continue to publish and recommend the other memos coming out on a rolling basis at the Rebuilding the Global Economy microsite on the Peterson Institute website. I am grateful to Peter Blair Henry, Dean Emeritus of the Stern School of Business at NYU, to Maury Obsfeld, the uh, ninth class of 1958 professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley and non-resident senior fellow at Peterson Institute, and to especially to Lauren Summers, who is the vice chair of the board of directors of the Peterson Institute for International Economics, and even more importantly, the 71st Secretary of the Treasury of the United States. Thank you all very much. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. Thank you, Adam. United States. Thank you all very much.